Hi, everyone. I hope you are all well. Thank you for being here today. I am Lorena Hakak, and together with Solange Gonçalves, we are two of the coordinators of the study group on family and gender economics, GEFAM, and we are going to mediate this webinar. If you have any questions, you can send it through the Zoom chat, or you can turn on your microphone and feel free to ask. Well, today we are pleased to welcome Julia Tura. She will present her paper, Marriage, Fertility, and Cultural Integration in Italy. Shall we get to know our guests better? Julia is a postdoc researcher in economics at the University of Milano Bicocca. Bicocca. Previously, she has been a Max Weber Fellow in Economics at the European University Institute. She received her PhD in Economics from the University of Bologna in 2017. During, during her PhD, she had been a visiting researcher at Bocconi University and a visiting PhD student at New York University. She is an applied microeconomist working primarily in labor economics. She has a particular interest in the economics of family and culture, with an emphasis of the dynamics of integration of immigrant minorities. Hi, Julia. Hi. Thank you Hi. so much for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, can I start sharing? Yes, you can begin whenever you... Okay. Feel free. Right. So um, I think it's normal. Please interrupt me <laughs> whenever you want with uh, with questions during the talk. Um, so today I'm going to present this project uh, about uh, marriage, fertility, and the integration of um, immigrants, immigrants minorities, in the context of Italy. And uh, it's a joint work with uh, Alberto Bizin from uh, New York University. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, recent migration flows, and I mean, that's a general statement, but recent migration flows into Western countries unveil new political and socioeconomic concerns. So, anti immigrant sentiments and the large support for restrictive immigration policies uh, seems to be motivated in part by labor and welfare consideration. So there is this idea that immigrants come here into host countries to take native jobs of, or native uh, welfare. But to a large extent, this tension seems to be motivated by the perceived cultural externalities that immigration imposes on natives in the integration process. So a successful cultural integration of minorities is a crucial issue for the development of host society. However, uh, integration is an equilibrium phenomenon. So it is both the result of a demand and a supply of integration. So on the demand side, we think that immigrants trade off uh, economic incentive to integrate, for example, in the labor market, with particular preferences to maintain their own cultural identity. While on the supply side, uh, natives modulate a uh, various degree of acceptance of immigrants' diversity or lack of acceptance. So while it seems very natural to think about integration as an equilibrium process, as a combination of this uh, demand and supply dimension, from an empirical point of view, it's really difficult to identify the importance of each of these components and to understand how these different components potentially affect uh, policies that we put in place to, to facilitate um, integration. So the, the goal of this paper is to take a structural approach and to think about integration as an equilibrium process and as an outcome of, um, uh, as the result of a process of uh, marital formation and intra-household cultural decisions. So essentially the paper is uh, divided in three parts. There is a model. It's a model about uh, 
marital matching, so it's a marriage model. Uh, there is fertility, so parents within the family choose how many kids to have, and there is cultural transmission. So there is this intergenerational components where family investments uh, contributes shaping the cultural belonging of new generations. And these investments in the model are motivated by specific cultural preferences. So now in the second part, uh, in the estimation, the goal is really to uh, estimate the model and identify these cultural preferences where you will see that what we can identify are preferences of immigrants, so the demand I was talking before, as well as preferences of natives, so in terms of the supply, for accepting uh, immigrants' minorities, uh, immigrants' diversity. So uh, I will come back to that, but these cultural preferences have a clear interpretation in the model, but essentially they reveal from choices how much a cultural group feel to be closer or farther apart to another one. Um, what we see in the, in the last part of the paper, so in the simulation, is that separating these demand and supply components is crucial for evaluating integration dynamics, so to have a sense of, uh, of the patterns of convergence of different minorities, and to identify the mechanism that potentially promote or slow down integration. So just to give you a preview of the results, what we uh, find is that, uh, so we estimate very strong but heterogeneous preferences of acting minorities for maintaining their own cultural identity. So just to give you uh, a sense, so the strength of the cultural transmission of um, preferences of parents ranges from 75% okay, for Middle East minorities, so they are uh, strongly um, in favor of maintaining their own cultural identities compared, for example, to European minorities living in Italy, where this kind of uh, cultural preferences is much lower and it's only about 10%. We see also that cultural, the, the cultural resistance of natives towards minorities is also uh, substantial. And uh, despite these strong preferences for maintaining their cultural identity, all minorities um, are stimulated to converge to the Italian majority. So they are all going to speak Italian at home um, in the very long run. But the, pattern, the patterns of, uh, of integration are significantly heterogeneous across minorities. This means that there are some groups that essentially converge in a generation. So in a first generation period, you see these minorities all speaking Italian for some groups, while for other groups, it takes much more time. So only third generation immigrants um, will essentially be um, completely integrated to the native culture. Uh, what we show is that marital selection and fertility choices are fundamental mechanisms to explain this heterogeneity. Okay, and, then, and I will um, come back to that. So um, in terms of the literature, so from a methodological point of view, this paper combines uh, the literature on marital matching and intra-household decisions models with um, a large literature on cultural transmission. Um, while in terms of the question, uh, essentially we contribute to the literature on migration by focusing on this identification of cultural preferences and the mechanisms that affects integration. So there is a large literature that is looking at it, the immigrants demand to preserve their identity by looking at intermarriages or uh, children first names or home language or neighborhood sorting. They are all looking at um, immigrants' preferences, essentially. And then there is a second part of the literature that is looking at natives, uh, native sentiments towards immigrants, either by looking at the economic roots or the political reactions to the presence of immigration. So we try to combine this, uh, these two literature together. 
So, so the rest of the talk, in the rest of the talk, I will uh, present the, the theoretical model and the implications of the model. I will move to the econometric framework. So I will be brief. I will try to describe, um, you know, the structural model, some of the assumption and, and uh, the most important part of the identification. I will move to the results and the dynamics part. And, uh, and I will conclude with, uh, with a brief discussion. So any question? No, okay. So, okay. So a sketch of the model. I mean, as I said, this is a model of the marriage market. Uh, it's a marital matching model with intra-household decision. So it's a large and frictionless marriage market. There are men and women utilities transferable across spouses and um, men and women are heterogeneous along cultural lines. So for simplicity in, 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 in the model, we consider that there are only two cultural traits. So there are natives uh, and, and immigrants I. So there are only two groups. Of course, we allow in the, in the estimation to have more um, to have different uh, immigrants group. But for now, there are only these two groups. So in the, in the marriage market, potentially family types are heterogeneous. So there are homogamous families. So families where both spouses share the same culture, while there are also heterogamous families, which are families where spouses do not share the same culture. So they have different cultural traits. And um, for what concerns intra-household choices, so any interaction is cooperative within marriage and we allow for non-cooperation upon divorce. So, okay, so this is somehow the, the, the timing. So the idea is that agents enter into the marriage market at the beginning and choose who they want to marry. So essentially they choose a spouse with a similar cultural background or not, and they choose forming expectations on their marital utility. Okay, so an allocation new tea will be formed um, as an equilibrium in the marriage market. Um, these marital utilities, so they form expectation on marital utilities and these marital utilities are the sum of two components a systematic component that is related to uh, fertility, divorce, and socialization, so whatever happens within the family, and an idiosyncratic component that captures additional returns from marriage. So there are essentially two, two um, random shocks that are pref individual uh, preferences for a type of spouse. Um, so given the allocation in the marriage couples are formed and within a marriage uh, spouses choose fertility so how many kids to have then uh, they update their knowledge on the quality of their marital union so they essentially observe this uh, theta which is a, a random shock a love shock and according to theta, they decide whether to remain married or not. So this theta is unknown at the moment of marriage and it's only known at the moment of divorce. So essentially the idea is that uh, negative surprises about love, so <laughs> couples that are not uh, loving each other anymore, uh, so negative value of theta potentially trigger divorce. And finally, so conditional on the couples and conditional on the divorce status, parents choose the socialization. Okay, so the effort tau. So, um, Julia, yeah, uh, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, uh, the individual idiosyncratic preference uh, in the marital matching is about. Uh, if you if you marry with the with the person uh, with the same culture or not? Uh, so this is an individual shock for a type of spouse. So essentially, there is a separability assumption which is standard in the uh, in the 
in the framework of uh, Chu and Xiao, where uh, I, as an individual, I draw uh, a shock uh, from a distribution that is equal for uh, a type of spouse, so for a native or an immigrant in this case. Okay. Do I answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay, so this is the uh, optimal matching problem. So it's simply the maximization of the total marital utility in the, in, in the market, net of this entropy component that captures the uh, unobserved heterogeneity in the model. So what is key, and essentially this is standard, it's a max problem subject to feasibility constraint that tells me that the number of married uh, individuals plus uh, the number of single has to be equal to the number of men and female present in the market to start with. So what is interesting in this model is how we write down the total systematic marital utility. Okay, so how the utility is formed within the marriage. Um, and this is written in equation two. So uh, what we assume is that spouses enjoy love. So utility is increasing in theta if they stay uh, married. Uh, then spouses um, enjoy having kids. So utility is increasing in N, even though there is a cost of raising kids. So there is a, essentially a quantity trade-off. Plus, there is a quality component associated to fertility in the sense that kids here are evaluated at the expected uh, utility from the socialization. Uh, so there is a quality associated to the value, um, to the expected value that kids will have depending on the culture that uh, they, will, um, they will acquire. So here, essentially, I'm talking about socialization. So let me explain a bit better. So when I'm talking about cultural socialization, I'm talking about parents. Uh, parents, I'm saying that parents have preferences uh, over the culture of children. So we assume that parents care about socializing their children, but uh, they are biased toward their own culture. So in notation, this means that the value that the parents obtains when socializing a child to his or her own cultural identity is strictly greater, is greater than the value that the same parents obtains if the child acquire a specific different uh, cultural ethnic identity. So the difference between these two values is assumed to be strictly greater than zero. So uh, an immigrant parent prefer to have an immigrant child compared to the value that the same immigrant parents gives um, if the child is integrated to the native culture. So these delta V parameters are the parameters that we are going to estimate. And they tell us essentially, they give us a sense of how much groups uh, feel to be closer or farther apart between each other. So uh, let me also say that technically these are preferences of parents for the children culture, but we can interpret them as cultural preferences of a group versus another culture. And notice that these may be, uh, these are not necessarily symmetric. So it, it may be that group H feel to be closer or has uh, a lower intolerance towards group J compared to the intolerance of group J towards group H. And uh, so not only parents have preferences, but they also have technologies. So culture is transmitted um, from one generation to the other by the society and via the family. So in some sense, the social environment, um, so let's think to teachers, uh, role models or peers contributes to the socialization of children and we assume that this contribution is proportional to the representation of the trait in the population which is captured by 
QH, which is a variable in the model, uh, an exogenous dimension in the model. Um, at the same time, um, culture is transmitted by parents, and this is uh, the endogenous component. So parents, given their preferences, choose how much they want to invest, so the effort uh, they put in the transmission of their culture to children. We assume uh, that both parents, uh, so both the father and the mother, are willing to socialize children. So the vector, so tau, it's a vector. So there is a, an effort of the mother and an effort of the father. And we assume that the uh, father socialization effort increases the probability that the child identify with his trait and similarly for the mother. So essentially the fathers contribute to the socialization of the children in transmitting his own culture and, and a similar reason for the mother. So this assumption essentially has an important implication because socialization technologies turns out to be family specific. This means that in families that are homogamous, so where both spouses share the same culture, they both parents benefit from coordinated socialization incentives in the sense that they both contribute, they both prefer to have a child who resemble their own culture and so they will both contribute to the socialization in the same direction. While in mixed couples, parents face conflicting socialization incentives because one parent will want to transmit his own culture and the other parents will want to transmit the other culture. Okay, So essentially, parents who share the same cultural traits enjoy a more efficient socialization technology in transmitting their shared trait compared to family where parents do not share the same culture. This is the key mechanism, uh, the, the key uh, component that is driving uh, the implications uh, and, and the results of the model. Okay, so- Julia, yes? just, just one thing, maybe it's a tiny thing, a detail. Uh, can you put in, the, the sure. yeah the D letter in the probability social in the socialization probability this D letter it means what it's uh, it's about divorce so uh, how, and like, how is related I couldn't get it yeah so I was quick um, so essentially what we assume is that when couples are um, there is a difference in socialization between families uh, who are married and um, and families who are divorced. In the case of okay. divorce, okay. we assume that only mother keeps the custody of children, and so they are only mothers transmit their own culture to children in case of divorce. So essentially, okay. this probability of socialization are driven by uh, by divorce. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So the model um, predicts um, positive assortative mating along cultural ethnic lines. So uh, predicts that um, because of this uh, somehow complementarity in the uh, process of cultural transmission, um, it's um, uh, uh, spouses will optimally choose, um, individuals will optimally choose uh, a partner, a spouse who shares similar uh, culture to start with. Uh, the model predicts that there is a larger uh, fertility rate in homogamous families because the quality of the socialization is much higher. And it predicts that there is a relative lack of stability of intermarriages. So uh, mixed marriages, are uh, more unstable compared to homogamous marriages. And uh, all these predictions that are in line with stylized fact that we observe in the data essentially derive from this systematic difference in socialization technologies between homogamous and heterogamous families. So uh, I will be quick, essentially I will not 
go through all the descriptives. Uh, maybe I will come back to that, but uh, all these predictions are uh, met in the data. So we observe in the data that there is strong uh, sorting, okay? strong preferences for mating a spouse who has the same culture, that fertility rates in homogamous families is always greater compared to the one that we observe in heterogamous families, and that there is much more um, higher separation rate in, in intermarriages compared to homogamous uh, marriages. So now to estimate the model. So the goal here of the estimation is to estimate parameters that has represent um, cost functions, parameters and other, but essentially to estimate the delta V. So the cultural intolerance parameters. So to do so, we extend the model to introduce, so we, we introduce variation and we extend the model along two lines. So we assume that there are multiple um, cultural ethnic traits. So we assume that there are six different minorities. So now there are uh, European, so AU15, other European, North Africa, Middle East, Sub-Saharan Africa, East Asia, and Latin America. So these are the six minorities that we consider and this classification reflects the uh, relative cultural distance of countries with respect to Italy. So just to give you um, an idea, so essentially we divide the world in these six uh, different uh, blocks and this um, classification somehow resemble what we observe uh, in terms of genetic distance of countries with respect to Italy or uh, ethnolinguistic distance of countries with respect to Italy. And then we, uh, we exploit variation across markets. So we introduce a multi-market framework with our regions where now each region in Italy, and we have 20 regions in total, is a separate and local marriage market. And we exploit variation in the distribution of minorities across the regions. So identification uh, essentially exploit these two sources of cross-sectional variation, variation across matches driven by different match type and across uh, markets. So in terms of the data, we have uh, very rich administrative data uh, provided by the um, Adele Lab, which is the elementary um, data laboratory uh, within ISTAT. Uh, you know, the data are amazing. The process to um, get the data, it's a little bit painful in the sense that um, these data are uh, sensible data. So you have to go to this lab and work from this lab. Okay, uh, that's what uh, we do. Uh, we did. Um, so ISTAT gives us um, data on marriages, and this is the universe of all marriages formed in Italy, more or less in 20 years, so from 95 to 2012. We have the universe of birth records, so kids born in Italy from the 90s to, 20, uh, to 2012, and um, and the universe of separations formed from 95 to 2012. So these are individual level data. So it was possible to create a key um, that uniquely identified uh, families. And so we were able to create a unique data set by matching marriages, birth and separation records. So we can keep track of uh, um, of what happens to a family from the moment of its very beginning, from the moment of marriage formation to subsequent records. So I know that the family is formed in a given year, and then I know that they have a first child, potentially a second child, that they separate or not, and so on and so forth. So the total is about uh, uh, 4 million observations, and they account for more or less, more than 90% of the universe of marriages that uh, we observe. Uh, Julia. Yes. Uh, can I ask you a question? Sure. Uh, do, do you consider only marriage or cohabitation? No, we well? only consider marriages. So 
yeah, we only consider these marriages are legal marriages. Legal marriages. Okay. Yes. But so we in information on cohabitations from the census, but uh, essentially the trend in cohabitation it's uh, a very recent trend in Italy. Okay. And, uh, so the, the rate of cohabitation in 2011, which is you know uh, really at the end of our uh, sample period was, uh, uh, if I remember correctly, about 9%, which is way below compared to the European average or the average in OECD countries. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, on top of this, we have information on singles. So we have essentially the universe of the population in Italy by marital status, so we can have a sense of what is the competition in the marriage market with the, you know, the, the distribution of availables in terms of men and women in the marriage market. We have population shares by ethnic group, and uh, we have we use this survey, which is the Condition and Social Integration of Foreign National Survey, conducted at the end of the period in 2011-2012, and we exploit the information of the language spoken at home by children to recover socialization frequency. So essentially here I'm saying that a kid is socialized to Italian, so to the native culture, whenever he speaks Italian at home. Okay, so that's the measure of socialization we are using. Um, we you know uh, I, I have a slide about this, so I prefer to to move on, uh, but uh, if you're interested, we, we can come back to that. So that's probably a little bit a, a boring slide. So it's a slide about all the assumption that we make essentially to translate our model uh, to the estimation. So um, socialization is proxied by language. So we restrict essentially the number of potential socialization probabilities, given the fact that we are talking about language. We introduce a parameterization for socialization and fertility cost. We introduce uh, uh, parameters for segregation bias, uh, where we assume that um, essentially the, the influence of a social environment is not one-to-one uh, -one with, with its representation in the society, but it's multiplied by a parameter row. Okay, so perfect one-to-one -one representation means row equal to one. For any row above one means that there is some, some degree of segregation of minorities. We introduce outside options for, um, for remaining singles, which varies across ethnic groups and across um, and, and for different matches. Um, we assume that Tita follows, Tita is the love component for divorce. It follows a logistic distribution. And then we assume a specific um, type one extreme value distribution for um, the unobserved heterogeneity at the moment of the marriage, which gives us a very nice um, identification equation for the gains to marriage. Okay, so essentially all this assumption provides us uh, a closed form solution for the moments we are interested in. So uh, we estimate the model via a method of moments estimation. So we simply uh, minimize the distance between the vector of empirical moments and the theoretical counterpart, which is a function of the parameters uh, beta, which is a, a vector of all the parameters that we have in the model. So we have a total, uh, so the vector of empirical moments is huge. So we have more than 2000 moments um, accounting for gains to marriage fertility rate, separation rates, and uh, socialization probabilities for all the different type of match and for all the regions that we have in Italy, so 20 regions. Okay, so um, the key assumptions behind the model are that essentially we, we set the value of uh, having a kids 
equal to uh, the culture of the parents, uh, equal to V, and this is constant for all the groups, and it's normalized to 100, and that's essentially um, a normalization. Um, the delta VIJ, so the cultural intolerance parameters, are specific to uh, an HJ, but they are constant across regions. The outside options, again, are constant across the regions, but they are allowed to vary um, across groups and across family types. Uh, all other parameters, so uh, fertility and uh, socialization costs, are independent across ethnic groups and regions. So let me just point out what is the ingredient or the, the twist for the identification of demand versus supply. So we use homogamous families, so families of both uh, immigrants, to identify demand. So in, in the, how it's constructed the problem, immigrants only um, in, the, in the problem of homogamous marriages uh, of immigrants minorities, uh, you know, the, the value uh, of marriage only depends on, on the demand parameter. So we can estimate demand from these homogamous families while supply is estimated as the residual for heterogamous families. Okay. Um, and okay, so here, let me give you an idea of the identification of the parameters. So, um, I will show essentially a table with delta V estimates. So let me say where this delta V comes from. So let's assume for the moment that there is a high demand of integration on the part of immigrants. So let's assume the extreme case where cultural barriers are completely break down and parents do not care at all about the culture of the kids. So they are completely indifferent between having a kids who resemble their own culture or the other culture. So in this case, the cultural intolerance is equal to zero. When there is no incentive at all for socialization, the model implies that there is no socialization effort. So the effort, the investment of parents is costly. So there is no, if there is no incentive, there is no need to invest, um, there is no need for investment, so tau is equal to zero, and the integration to the Italian is perfect. So we will observe um, kids speaking Italian at all. The separation, we will observe a separation rate that is high because there is less need to rely on homogamous technologies for socialization. The fertility rate will be high because there is an higher uh, quality of children because I mean different and uh, it's less risky to have kids who does not resemble my character and the gains to marriage will be higher so in equilibrium you will see a large demand for intermarriages with natives compared um, to a case where instead um, cultural intolerance is high okay so essentially I will estimate uh, a low cultural intolerance for those groups for which I observe um, that kids speak a lot of Italian, for which I observe that there is a high separation rates, high fertility rates, and a large number of intermarriages with natives. So these are uh, our estimates. So. Um, so this is a plot of the distribution of cultural preferences. So in the in panel A, I plot uh, preferences of migrants towards the cultural intolerances of migrants towards natives. So the demand part. While on panel B, I plot um, cultural preferences of natives towards immigrants. Um, so, as you can see, there are essentially three results to point out. First of all, cultural intolerance parameters are strictly greater than zero. So, immigrants have a demand for maintaining their own cultural identity, which is larger compared to economic or legal incentive they, they may have for integration. The second point is that 
all these parameters are uh, highly heterogeneous across groups. So immigrants from North Africa, Middle East uh, have marked preferences for maintaining the cultural identity. So a child integrated to the native culture for a North African parent is valued 65% less uh, than one socialized to the parents' culture. And the same loss is only about 10% for European minorities. So, you know, uh, it's, it's a huge difference. And um, as a third point, the matrix of uh, parameters is asymmetric. So, for example, you see that the intolerance of Latin American minorities towards natives is much higher compared to the intolerance of natives towards migrants. And this is a bit an outlier in the sense that in all other cases, natives are much more intolerant uh, compared to immigrants. Uh, the only exceptions is Latin America compared to, um, is, um, is the cultural intolerance of Latin America to, uh, toward, toward Italians. Uh, compared to the acceptance of Italian for Latin American immigrants. Julia. The, yes. Uh, it's Lorena. Uh, the 65% of the uh, Middle East that yeah. you spoke, it's, it's what about? I, I lost the explanation. So the, the value uh, of having a child, uh, so for, um, for all the groups, we set the value of having a child equal to uh, the culture of the parents equal to 100. So the delta V, so this uh, what I plot, represent the, the difference between this 100 and the perception of having a kid um, who is integrated to the native culture. So the, the higher is the bar, the higher is the intolerance of the minorities uh, with respect to the native culture in this case. So the kids is valued 65% less um, um, from the point of view of a North African uh, parent. Okay, thank you. Julia, sorry, yeah. uh, this is Jessica. I also have a question on these lines. So in the, in the B uh, graph, natives yeah. towards migrants. So these are natives parents that have a, a kid that like with a, with a migrant. I, I didn't, I, I completely understood like the first explanation for migrants towards natives, but I didn't understand the other way around. I'm sorry. So like for, natives towards migrants. So these, these are cultural preferences. So these are the preferences of different immigrants groups towards natives. While here are preferences of natives towards uh, different immigrants groups. So this is, uh, you know, the perception of an Italian in, uh, for um, the cultural preference of an Italian uh, for having a child uh, who may turn out to be European and it's valued 30 30% less compared okay. to a child which is Italian. Got it, yeah. Thank you so much. But if I'm a native and I potentially have a child who is uh, sub-Saharan Africa, then the value is 80% less compared to having a child who is native. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um... That's okay. Okay, so these are uh, our estimates. So what we did then is to simulate the model over time and look at the long-term dynamics of, um, of the distribution of traits in the population. So what we do essentially is uh, that we take men and women, uh, we put, uh, in a, we observe men and women, and we observe the distribution of cultural traits of men and women in the population. We take all these men and women and we put them in the marriage market. And according to our preferences, we marry them 
and then they have kids, they separate or not, and then they socialize their children. So at the second point, we observe a new distribution of cultural traits in a society for the second generations. And then we take this second generation, we wait until they are adults, we put them in the marriage market according to the new distribution of traits. Uh, they marry, they have kids, and these new kids are socialized. And then we observe the distribution of third generations and so on, okay? So essentially we take our model and we uh, use this, um, we exploit the fact that we have a model that tells us what is uh, the um, intergenerational uh, transmission of culture. Okay, so what you see in this, um, in this plot, um, okay, so what you see in this plot is that on the uh, vertical axis, you have the share of um, the share of all the group that is normalized to one at T0, just for, you know, um, reading better the, the table. And on the horizontal line inside, you see the time dimension. So it's indexed to one at T0, so any dot above one implies that there is a, uh, a divergence. Any dot below one means that there is some convergence. So the share uh, of um, the share of a given minority is lowering over time, okay? And these are our results. So we show that all minorities uh, integrate to the Italian culture in the long run, in the sense that they are going all to speak Italian at home with their children. A lot of this convergence takes place at the very beginning. So 75% of the integration, uh, we estimate an integration rate of 75% in the period of a generation. Um, but as you can see, the pace uh, of convergence is really heterogeneous across groups. So Europeans and other European minorities essentially converge almost completely to the majoritarian culture, so to the Italian culture in a single generation, while a slower convergence characterizes some other groups. And um, the heterogeneity is driven by essentially three different mechanisms. So there is one mechanism represented by selection into homogamous marriages. So sub-Saharan African minorities are the ones who select uh, more into homogamous marriages. And so they rely on, um, uh, on, on the ability of transmit their own culture much more. Um, there is a selection into fertility. So East Asian minorities have more children and so uh, by the law of large man numbers, there is a higher uh, fraction of, um, of those groups uh, uh, maintaining the culture. And then there is a third mechanism that is represented by the relative importance of the men versus supply. So in the case of Latin America, as I said before, this is the only group that have uh, as access to socialization also in intermarriages with natives in the sense that all the other groups when they are married with natives um, they have an intolerance which is lower compared to the one of natives so they are not going to directly socialize children their children within intermarriages while this is the opposite for latin america so they they have an extra component of socializations also in intermarriages. And this allows them to keep, um, to maintain their culture for more time. So to dig deeper into the mechanisms uh, driving integration, we propose two counterfactual where first we shock supply. So we change the Delta V for natives, and then we change the Delta V for immigrants. So in this first example, we simulate a, a supply shock and we set the cultural intolerance of natives toward minorities equal to zero. So now natives offer complete acceptance of the immigrants' cultural diversity. 
So they accept all the diversity coming from, uh, coming from immigrants. And uh, what we see is that we show a remarkable persistence in cultural diversity. So essentially there is no integration of second generation immigrants and the fraction of the population composed of non-integrated immigrants increased by 15%. Okay, and that's intuitive because now, because there is no bias in the marriage market with natives, you know, immigrants uh, marry more with natives, so there are more intermarriages because the socialization conflict is muted. Uh, so immigrants uh, can achieve higher socialization rates also in intermarriages. So at equilibrium, there are more intermarriages, uh, there are more children in intermarriages, and this reduces integration overall. Okay, so immigrants are more able to maintain their culture. Uh, on the other side, and these are more or less the, the mechanism behind the results, um, we also simulated the men's shock. So we strengthened the dominance of the cultural identity in immigrants' demand. Can, you know, we can interpret as, you know, a strengthening of preferences for cultural identity or a reduction in economic incentives. And what we see in this case is that there is a, a larger, um, you know, a stronger convergence that accelerates by 10 percentage point compared to the baseline. So in this case, the stronger attachment of immigrants to their identity makes marriage riskier and much more uh, and, and a costly, uh, costlier investment. So the utility that they receive if they fail to socialize children is significantly lower. So the more uh, I'm, um, I'm intolerant, uh, you know, in accepting a kid who has a different identity to compare to my own, the more riskier is to invest in a kid. So the value of marriage essentially reduces. So in this context, uh, you know, the, there are fewer children, but there are also fewer homogamous and also heterogamous marriages. So essentially there is a, an effect of compression in the marriage market. And while um, the probability that the child with an immigrant parent is integrated to the Italian culture is lower, so the socialization rates of minorities is larger, but the fraction of the population of these immigrants turns out to be lower compared to the one of natives. Okay. Um, I don't know if I'm running out of time. So then we have some uh, counterfactual where we simply assume that there are some inflows of second generations coming in. And we observe that different inflows, inflows uh, of second generation immigrants have uh, different uh, responses in terms of, uh, in terms of integration uh, for the different groups. Um, let me move to the summary and um, um, yeah. Uh, uh, Julia, and, if you yes. want to 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 uh, show the counterfactual, feel free. Or if you prefer to, feel yes, free. I, I, I will just uh, yeah. When just to conclude here to post ah, okay okay this result so. Uh, overall, what we, uh, we simulate a substantial heterogeneity in integration rates and a 75% integration in a, in a generation period. Um, we observe that there are more accepting, pref the more accepting preferences of natives leads to a slower cultural integration and the reduction in economic incentive increase integration rates. Uh, let me focus here on the last ballot point. So we also try to evaluate uh, a policy that uh, a segregation policies of immigrants in the society, where this segregation essentially has the effect of um, increasing the ethnic network of minorities. When we have uh, more segregation of immigrants in the society, we show that there is a uh, an improvement in the social welfare. Uh, 
um, with the both positive uh, contemporaneous but also dynamic social welfare effect. So uh, we think that this, uh, I'm not entering into the details, but essentially this conclusion may represent a starting point for a debate about uh, residential location, but also school choice and religious freedom of immigrants with important implication, you know, as society become, becomes more um, ethnically uh, heterogeneous than they used to be in the past. So just to conclude, these papers um, offer a new perspective to interpret cultural integration as an equilibrium outcome we show how the dynamics of integration respond to variation both in demand, but also in the supply, so in the natives' acceptance of immigrants' diversity. Um, this paper provides novel implications for the evaluation of different immigration policies, and potentially in the future, I think it's, uh, it will be particularly interesting to explore how integration outcome um, change due to institutional changes or changes in economic conditions. Um, yeah, and, and that's it. Okay. Thank you, that's... Julia. Okay. Can I see some of you? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, now we can open for questions. Uh, Julia, I have a question before the yeah. audience. So <laughs> uh, congratulations for the paper. It's a very interesting paper. I have a question about uh, if it could be possible to bring to our model some uh, heterogeneity on education of parents. So I don't know if uh, the, the parameter of preference that's about natives and migrants are, uh, if it could be, if it would be necessary to have this other source of uh, heterogeneity. And if you have this information in our database, so if parents are high or low education, I don't know, with this kind of uh, additional no, no, source. Absolutely uh, a very good point. And uh, so we have information on education. We have also information on, on age. Uh, and we have some information on the um, economic conditions or the profession or the occupational status of, of spouses at the moment of the marriage. So... Um, so the choice here, here was really to focus on, uh, this is essentially a, a unidimensional model. So individuals are only identified by culture and, and the key uh, and the choice was really to have a model of uh, marriage market along cultural lines and explain why uh, cultural sorting, so optimal selection along cultural lines emerge in the marriage market because of intra-household choices. Um, so essentially in this literature, either you have you know, a unidimensional model of marriage with intra-household choices, or my sense is that you know, there are more multidimensional models of the marriage market where you try to estimate different trade-off across different characteristics. So one thing that we can do is to try to condition some of our moments to account for education. That's something that we did for fertility. Um, so we, instead of using the fertility rate, we, um, we regress fertility on the education of parents as well as uh, marital duration and age to net the effect of these other observables and we use the residuals of fertility in the model and the estimates are more or less the same except for um, East Asia minorities so they, they change uh, for this group they change a little bit um, one thing that we can do is probably provide some reduced form evidence that uh, even controlling for sorting along educational lines 
uh, this doesn't affect too much um, the cultural dimension. Um, let me say that I was working in parallel or you know, in, in a different project, which is exactly about that, uh, that is trying to estimate trade-off uh, between um, culture, so cultural preferences, education, age, and also um, legal status incentives. So, yeah. Great. But, but it's, uh, yeah, uh, a good point. Thank you. We have a question from Paula Miranda Ribeiro. Paula, if you, you can turn on your microphone, feel free. Obrigada, uh, Solange. Thank you. Uh, Julia, thank you for your presentation. I'm Paula Miranda Ribeiro. I'm from CEDEPLAR, Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. Uh, it's very, I mean, I really enjoyed your presentation. And my question is, does the gender of the native parent matters? Because my, I, I, I would say that if the mother is the one that's the foreigner, she's most likely to keep her culture with their children. Whereas if it's the father, you know, mothers spend more time with children. So it has to do with language as well. If the mother is the one that's the foreigner at home, she's more likely to speak her own her mother language with her children, whereas the father won't because he's away from home. So, I mean, th this is my question. Do you think, or do you have the data for, or, or results about that? Thank you. Uh, so, no. So, essentially, what we are estimating are, uh, and. True, it's very interesting. So uh, let me reply in two steps. So um, for the sake of this model, essentially, no, we estimate these cultural preferences that does not depend on the gender. So the intolerance of, you know, uh, an East Asian minorities towards the natives is the same, whether the, you know, the minority, the immigrant I'm talking about is a man or a female. It's true that what we observe in the data in marriage is that there is, uh, you know, the, the distribution of marriages is not symmetric by gender. So there are many more Italian men marrying a foreign women compared to the number of Italian women marrying a foreign men. Okay, but we do not keep track of these gender differences, and. Uh, um, Another thing that we are that you are mentioning is uh, somehow this, um, you know, uh, trying to put more structure in the socialization technologies with the idea that you know the effort that you put can be uh, investment in terms of time. So and probably mothers put much more time in talking about. Uh, talking the language with kids, they spend more time with children. Um, while vice versa, probably fathers put uh, many more, um, you know, spend more in terms of uh, monetary investment because, um, okay. So trying to discriminate whether the, you know, monetary uh, investment compared to uh, time investment have a different effect in these production functions will be very interesting. At this stage, we don't have this information. We just know what's the language spoken and that's it. I think that it will be very different across groups. So I can imagine that um, Muslim father will be very powerful and have a lot of bargaining power because of the structure of the family. So they will be, um, you know, very strict in the kind of, um, um, in the socialization they want, no matter uh, what is doing the mother. And probably it will be different for other groups. So it's a combination of gender and, um, and, and origin. Um, yeah, it's a, 
it's a very good point. Okay, thank you so much. I, I was just thinking that uh, of, I do qualitative work, so that's what kept me thinking of you know possibilities. And then, if you think about, for instance, food at home, if you have a foreign mother, the kids are more likely to eat the the types of food that the mother learned how to make and the, the, the ones she likes, then the opposite. So there are lots of things probably going on that, of course, I know this is a, an econometric model, but somehow uh, yeah. at least maybe run separately from like from uh, when the, the mother is foreigner versus when the mother is the native and then compare results to see if there is a difference. It's, it's just a suggestion. Oh, but good. thank you so much, Julia. I was, uh, I will, I want to, uh, I was thinking about what she asked, and maybe the the result that you have in your model will be different if you have, for example, more more men, more Italian men, mar they 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 marry uh, in, a, in a larger proportion known Italian women than, than Italian women with foreigner men, uh, probably the result will be different. The cultural, uh, the cultural, um, the, 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 uh, the, what we, what you, the results will be different and um, maybe you will have more heterogamous or more homogamous marriage when you consider this heterogeneity between men and women, native. So it's true. So somehow the, the, the preferences that we estimate are somehow an average, uh, are averaging between potentially these gender differences. Um, one important thing is that it's true that we observe, um, uh, you know, a different distribution of marriages, but the inflows of migrants is not uh, homogeneous in terms of origin and gender. So let me say, uh, Italian men are marrying a lot of East European women, but it's also true that there are a lot of, there are many more East European women compared to East European men who are coming into mm -hmm. Italy. So it, you must okay. track both of these things. It's okay. true that uh, Italian women are marrying more uh, Sub-Saharan uh, or Middle East uh, immigrant men, but it's also true that there are many more uh, East immigrant men compared to women. So these men do they not have, you know, an easy, uh, easy way to find an homogamous marriage otherwise. Um, so th this is something that it's accounted for in the model. Um, okay. But in terms of gender preferences, we, we do not have this distinction. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Anna? Do you have a question? Anna and Paula, again? Yes. Well, first of all, Julia, uh, congrats for your study. It's really very, very interesting and really, really good. Uh, I was wondering, because my area is uh, more, it's not that matching, it's more uh, intra-household allocation. And this last topic, uh, future work, uh, you intend, as my idea is to, to study how integration outcomes respond to institutional change in economic conditions. It's like uh, how uh, the, the so-called distribution factors uh, uh, influences, how is the effect of distributional factors uh, in, influences the, the, the bargain power of this household, of the couples, you know, like who has uh, more bargain power, the native or the, or the immigrant? And the gender has a lot of uh, 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 
things to do with this is is in this direction that you're thinking about like you, you first of all you 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 study the matching thing and now you study the the relation the the or is i i i'm misunderstood your future work no no so your idea probably it's richer than what i'm no. thinking about actually so uh, no, when I'm thinking about in institutional changes, I'm thinking essentially to uh, a different project I'm working on where uh, we observe, um, so the idea is very simple, is that, uh, you know, there are many different factors that affect marriage choices for immigrants. One is culture, uh, but there are other dimensions like education that was mentioned before, age but also legal status so immigrants may have an incentive to marry uh, to intermarry with natives simply to have legal access to the labor market um, and so uh, in, in in a different project we use the enlargement of, of the european union to east european countries as a source of exogenous variation because at a certain point some countries uh, got legal status essentially for for free, so without um, the need to, um, to marry with a native, uh, while some other immigrants group not. And, and we see a huge uh, change in the patterns of intermarriages for this group at the moment of the enlargement. Um, so, the, so the idea is simply to see that, uh, you know, those institutional changes like European enlargement affect incentives for marriage and so change the allocation of marriage within the marriage market making some trade-off much more salient compared to others um, then there was a second point that you were talking about uh, related more to gender and, and bargaining power so uh, that's more an idea but i'm not working on it i find a uh, there was a recent paper about um, about uh, veil ban in in France and how veil ban changed um, the education of second generation Muslim female in France. And I think that this this is only my guess. I I don't have the data. I, I, I'm not uh, currently working on it. But I was thinking that these changes, these institutional changes of restriction, let's say, to religious freedom, have a concrete effect in terms of education. But this potential effect on ed education may imply some, you know, um, some may change the returns of education in the marriage market. So, uneducated uh, Muslim female may have lower bargaining power or lower ability to find uh, you know, an homogamous spouse or a native spouse in the marriage market, simply because they cannot rely on this other dimension you know, to trade off culture with something else. So potentially there are you know, dynamic effect uh, making this group segregating even more. This is, uh, uh, you know, uh, what has been established is the first part, that the ban have, you know, detrimental effect for education. The second part, it's just my conjecture, but it's more in line about what we were saying about, um, you know, how these institutional changes potentially affect um, bargaining power or choices in the marriage market. But yeah, more research there. <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much and congrats again. Is there any other question? Paula, Paula has a question. Paula has a question, Paula? Thank you again, I'm sorry. I, I was just, you know, thinking about how Latin Americans behave so differently. Uh, any thoughts why even in a third generation Latin Americans are not totally integrated with this kind of striking. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. 
Yeah, so essentially, um, that's nice because um, so the, the, the key here is that uh, Latin America are the only group that have a strong preferences to maintain their culture compared to the natives. So natives are much more acceptant of immigrants' diversity. This means that you know a native is much more happy to have a children speaking Spanish at home compared to any other different language. So Latin America are more able to sustain their culture. So this doesn't necessarily mean that they are not integrated at all. There are a lot of intermarriages, but in these intermarriages, Latin America have slightly uh, have, have more ability to sustain their culture. So that's why the result. Why we estimate the Delta V is precisely because we observe a lot of Italian men marrying um, Latin America women. And in those intermarriages, the fertility rate is very high and it's comparable to the fertility rate in homogamous Latin America families. So it seems that you know natives, uh, when they marry with uh, essentially Italian males, when they marry with the Latin America female, they really perceive these women as close, uh, as not particularly distant in terms of culture, and so you know the, the the choices within their marriage are very similar to the one um, of homogamous Latin America couples. So this is why we estimate these parameters and uh, and and the patterns uh, follows because of this. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Is there any other question? I don't see the chat, so I, I don't know where the... Okay, oh, okay because I, okay. Can I ask a question? Yes. Hi, hi, Julia. It's, it's not a question about your work in strict sense, but a curiosity about Italian, because we know that immigrate, immigrants, they, they arrive in different, different ways. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I don't know what was going on in terms of these waves and which groups are getting in, into Italy during the period that you are analyzing. Uh, can you give them a, 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 can you tell me something about how, what are the different groups that are coming and for example, from, mm -hmm. from Europe, they are, they tend to be, the, the, they tend to be more continuous coming, but uh, in the other groups, there might be uh, some waves. And, and it's just a curiosity, it's not yeah, yeah. strictly so, direct to your work. So, um, first of all, there is some heterogeneity over time in the inflows that are coming across different origins, uh, and especially from different countries of origin. Um, we don't have enough data to exploit this variation over time. So what we do is essentially we, we look at Italy and we take a picture of these 20 years without any considerations over time. We, we just, you know, um, sum all the marriages and that's it. Uh, on top of this, the, the immigration was uh, very low in Italy. So in 93, there were only um, 600,000 uh, foreigners in Italy, like 1% uh, of the population, and now it's more than 10%. So it's, you know, it really increased uh, over time. At the very beginning, you know, there was some mix, but a lot of people were coming from European, especially from Albania, for example, and from... Uh, um, North African countries like uh, Morocco and Egypt. Um, then later on, we have more influx for uh, from other European countries, uh, Asia, and then uh, Middle East and Sub-Saharan Africa. 
the incoming from Latin America is more recent. Um, taking into account that some Latin America have Italian citizenship because of previous immigrations of Italians. So these are, um, you know, these are not immigrants in our data. We cannot, um, um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's true that um, I can put a, a graph about this. Solange? Any? Is no, there no. A, no? Okay. 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 Thank you, Julia, again. Congratulations. Yes. Yeah. Thank it was you. A pleasure. Yes. Yes, it was a pleasure. Thank you for your presentation. It was very nice. Thank you for inviting me. I mean, it was a, a surprise and an honor, honestly. And um, thank you for the question. And you received very, very interesting question. Uh, some are really interesting thoughts uh, to, <laughs> or points to think about uh, more. So thank you very much. And um, we will remain in contact for, for next week. Okay, okay. The the work never ends. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Okay. Thank you everyone. See you all on April 23rd when we will see receive Maria Joaquin from Puki Rio and Jefa. Bye bye. See you on uh, on April 23rd.